to what extent are we making ourselves miserable by expecting to find happiness in one person or one person to check all of these boxes, including romantic notions that seem to have largely started in the Western world with the troubadours and so on? I don't know if that's a coherent question, but since you have more experience with these things than I do, I'd love to hear you speak to that in any way whatsoever. That's a deep question, kind of a hard one. I, I think it's a great insight that a lot of marriages in the past were either arranged, right, by the parents, and or had ulterior motives, mm-hmm. even if it was just to get the crops in. I mean, we're joking about economies of scale, but economies of scale were not unimportant in most of human history. You had kids partly to help you slop the hogs, I mean, and milk the cows, <laughs> right? And to take care of you when you got old. These were very pragmatic, unromantic ideas. Having said that, any trip through uh, Western literature, you understand there's a little both, right? You read Shakespeare, you read Jane Austen. Jane Austen's characters usually are striving to make a advantageous match, not a love match. Mm-hmm. But they also fall in love. So that's one of the reasons I think her books are so uh, compelling. Uh, they don't just want to be pragmatic. But, but it's a very deep question of whether, of what you should look for, what you should expect of marriage. And, and I think Hollywood misleads us a little bit. You know, the look across the room, and I've argued there are very few movies that capture love, right? There are movies that capture romantic attraction, sexual attraction. I'll give you an exception. My Fair Lady. Mm. Not a very PC or, you know, politically correct movie in in modern times, but it's a fascinating portrait of how Henry Higgins falls in love with Eliza Doolittle despite himself, right? He doesn't want to fall in love. He sees his bachelorhood life as an ideal, kind of like Darwin, actually, and yet he finds himself falling in love. And, um, you know, it's one of the most beautiful love songs ever written when you think, how do you capture that feeling of real love, not just attraction? He says, I've grown accustomed to her face. Mm -hmm. What a magnificent, magnificent line, right? Her smiles, her frowns, her ups, her downs. They're second nature to me now, like breathing out and breathing in. Like That's an incredible portrait of domestic life, right? Yeah. My point being that art actually pays some attention to this thing that evidently has been around for a long time. It's not just about sexual attraction, it's about love and romantic attraction, or whatever you want to call that, partnership, symbiosis to make it really as unromantic as possible, maybe even less romantic than uh, economies of scale at Costco. (laughs) But I think to come back to the nub, so what should you look for? What should you expect? You know, and is it worth it? Is it worth something? Is it something you should strive for? I'll just say what, you know, we can talk about this for the other five hours, but the, the one thing I would add I don't like it when people say, you know, you have to work at your marriage. You have to work at it. That's not the way I think of my marriage. I work at crossword puzzles. <laughs> I work at, at ditch digging. I work at, you know, writing up my notes for my next podcast. But what you do have to do is you have to treat your partner as a partner. As opposed to somebody who, you know, lives with you, who's pleasant to have as a roommate. They're two different things. And I think in modern life, we have not, we've taken away for a thousand reasons the responsibilities of marriage. And, And I think that's come at a cost, right? And it's made it harder for people to get married. If you look at the data, it's pretty obvious. Let's be scientific for a minute. People are marrying later or not at all, it's changed. And the the appeal, this comes back to the Darwin point, the appeal of a long-term commitment from the outside is mostly negative for most people. Mm -hmm. I think certainly for most men. I don't know if women are different, but they uh, seem to be. It's not fashionable to say that, but I think they are. But men, it's hard. Men struggle to stay in a long-term relationship. And it's not as appealing to either side. It's pretty obvious in the data. So what do you do? I don't know. Tricky. Could you say more about the 
diminishing of the responsibilities of marriage and what you mean by that? The part I like about you have to work at your marriage is it it is hard. Mm -hmm. There are parts about marriage that are hard. There's, there's parts about having a good marriage that are difficult, that are challenging. There's a great line from Annie Lamott. She says, her name for God, not me. <laughs> <laughs> right? And most of us naturally see ourselves as God, center of the universe, most important thing, easy. And I think one of the great advantages of marriage is to remind you that it's not all about you. And, you know, some people find that appealing and some people don't. I think I took this line out of the book, but I have a friend who said, uh, until you get married, his father told him this, until you get married, you're an idiot. I feel that sometimes. I think there's a lot of truth to that. And living with another person as a commitment, not as a contract, very important difference. I talk about it in the book. It's more of a covenant and less of a contract is really a powerful way to be alive. It's basically, this is to enhance what I said earlier about what a real marriage is about. It's not about working at it. Well, let's have a session where we talk about our you know, issues. It's about remembering, comes back to what we said at the very beginning of this conversation, remembering things that are very hard to remember, that you're in this together, that this other person has a soul, a desire, a, f a flavor, a preference, and that's hard because you have yours. And you know what? I like getting what I want, don't you? Yeah, we do, most of us, <laughs> most of the time. And to figure out how to mesh your plans with your partner's plans, and not just what we're doing on Sunday night, because we can take turns and we'll do Italian tonight, and next week we'll do Chinese, but how to make a life together is um, really hard and beautiful and deeply rewarding if it goes well. And when it doesn't go well, it's horrible, by the way. I don't want to romanticize it at all, right? It's horrible, awful, stultifying, degrading. It's bad. So it's a high-risk game. And to come back to your earlier question, for most of human history, it wasn't a choice. It was a destiny. It wasn't a decision. You got married. You had to. You felt that way anyway. It doesn't feel that way anymore. Whole new world. All right. So I have a number of follow-up questions, and I'm not going to spend the next hour on marriage, so don't worry. But I do have one clarifying question, which is, until you're married, you're an idiot. Are you? In, does that refer to being an idiot in the sense of being so egocentric and self-referential that you just don't have the sort of lens or experience of the world that is as broad and more complete as someone who has decided to partner with someone else? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. <laughs> yeah, that's it exactly. It's not the All normal right. kind of, let me say it in a slightly different way. I've come to believe as I've gotten older that a huge part of, quote, growing up, you know, we like to joke, hey, Tim, what are you going to do when you grow up? You know, like like you still have room to grow. Well, I hope you do, right? We're not all grown up. <laughs> Me it's, too. It's, it's like Shalem, right? You're not whole. You're not grown up. One of the funniest things in life is you look at the people older than you and you think, when I'm their age, I'll feel the way they do. And you get to that age and you don't, right? <laughs> you look at the seniors in high school when you're a sophomore. Wow, they're so confident and they seem so at ease. I can't wait till I'm a senior. Then you're a senior. It's like, they were all faking it. Every one of them, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's a great thing, I think, to admit that I'm not grown up. I haven't figured it all out. I haven't not mature fully, more mature maybe than I was before, but I'm not mature. It's hard. So a lot of what, to me, of a life well lived is about growing up. And marriage is one way to grow up. Not the only way. There are other ways to grow up. Religion, meditation, psychotherapy, marriage, they're all about self-awareness. They're all, if they're done well, they're all about recognizing that you're part of a much bigger picture than you feel like most of the time. And I think that's really helpful and incredibly satisfying when you sense it. It's great. 